landscaping thought. There's already a paradigm shift. Uh, earlier, uh, landscaping was thought of as a, a means for uh, improving the visual quality of uh, the built environment. And, uh, but then uh, because of this energy crisis, uh, there's a paradigm shift uh, towards energy conservation. And that has been going on for quite some time. And we have included uh, this uh, landscaping for microclimate modification and energy conservation uh, in our syllabus, in the uh, BR and uh, master syllabus in uh, Githam University. But apart from that, uh, today, uh, after this uh, cyclone Hudud, uh, we were in a position to carry out a lot of studies about uh, the damage to landscape elements uh, along the coastal corridor of Vishakapatnam. And from these studies, we could conclude that there also has to be a paradigm shift in uh, how you go about uh, carrying out landscaping in uh, cyclone prone areas. So this is the gist of my presentation today. Uh, so can I share the screen? Yes, sir. So this is the title of the presentation, Disaster Resilient Landscaping for Cyclone Prone Areas. What is the meaning of resilient? Resilient uh, talks about the coping capacity. So if the coping capacity of a particular individual or a particular place is high, then uh, they can uh, adjust to certain types of disasters. If the resilience is less, then they become susceptible. Um, so this is what I was telling you about. Uh, there is a paradigm shift in landscaping thought. Now, what is the meaning of paradigm? All of you might be aware about it, but I'll just uh, tell you the actual meaning of paradigm. It occurs quite often. Uh, paradigm is a pattern. You know, in your mind, you have different patterns about uh, people, about places, about certain ideas. All these are there in your mind. And based on these uh, paradigms, which are there in your mind, your uh, response towards certain events or certain concepts, or even the way you interact with, uh, you know, different people, uh, all this is uh, dictated by the paradigms in your mind. For example, uh, you know, if you uh, have heard from people that so, uh, Mr. X is a very strict person and uh, even without knowing that person, you make up, uh, you have a, uh, you know, uh, idea in your mind that is very strict. But uh, paradigms start changing once you get further information about that particular topic. For example, uh, you might interact with this strict person and later on find out that he's not actually strict, he's a very kind and nice person. Then what happens? You undergo a paradigm shift and the way you perceive him changes. Similarly, uh, is the case with different ideas or different uh, concepts. So earlier, you know, landscaping was uh, uh, basically uh, an ornamental uh, area and uh, plants and shrubs and uh, ground covers and water and soil. These were used mainly for uh, increasing the uh, aesthetic appeal of uh, uh, different spaces. Um, and nobody really bothered much about uh, saving of these uh, resources. For example, water is a very important uh, resource in landscape uh, design. And uh, if you, all of you must have studied, those who are architects might have studied about the French gardens where they had around 30,000 fountains. Now today, if you talk about uh, having 30,000 fountains, you'll be arrested because uh, you can't uh, waste so much uh, uh, water. So today there's a paradigm shift in landscaping thought. And apart from uh, the ornamental quality, 
uh, energy conservation has become a buzzword and it is being adopted in various landscaping projects. Now coming to the present topic, uh, on 12th August 2014, a very severe cyclone called Hudud that uh, made its landfall in uh, Vishakapatnam and uh, it caused a lot of damage to infrastructure and uh, to uh, buildings and also the land uh, la ground cover in the coastal corridor and even in other parts of the city. And, uh, you know, like uh, uh, most of the damage was uh, along the coastal corridor, which is a 30, 27 uh, kilometer stretch from uh, coastal battery in Vishakapatnam till Bhimli Patnam. So uh, soon after this uh, 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 cyclone, uh, a study was carried out. Uh, we did a study of all the damage to infrastructure buildings and especially landscaping in our campus, in the Gitam University campus, which is located along this coastal corridor uh, en route to Bhimli Patnam. So our uh, university pro, uh, became like a laboratory where uh, we could uh, study how these different uh, types of trees were damaged. Now, what was the basic motivation behind this particular study? You now, behind any study, there has to be some motivation. Now, here, let me tell you, uh, you know, uh, this study took almost uh, around uh, 30 days. And um, uh, like, um, it involved a lot of uh, travel and, uh, you know, all the pictures that you're going to see, they're all uh, uh, taken uh, by me. And, uh, you know, like, uh, um, it took a lot of time. Now, uh, why is someone spending uh, so much time in this particular area? The reason was, before uh, doing the study, uh, I was studying a particular uh, tree, which was uh, there uh, in our campus, uh, just in front of an architecture building. And that is a Spathodia Campanulata tree. And um, this tree had a uh, lot of flowers, red color flowers. And, um, you know, I was observing certain birds were coming there, uh, especially mina birds. And we could hear the music uh, from the minas. And after some time, you know, when the flowers went off, uh, parrots would be coming uh, because these parrots actually, they come, uh, uh, to open the seeds of this uh, Spathodia Kambalonata tree and uh, they just uh, pull out the fluff and leave. After that, squirrels come. So we made some videos, we covered this entire thing and uh, it was uh, quite an interesting uh, study showing the, uh, you know, interrelationship or the symbiotic uh, relationship uh, uh, in different types of ecosystems. For example, in this case, the um, uh, uh, Campanulata tree. But then uh, what happened to this tree during this uh, particular cyclone was this entire tree got uprooted and, um, you know, like it uh, fell on the road. So now what happened was uh, the angle of study changed after this. So earlier we were um, focusing on the, you know, like other characteristics of the tree. And now um, the inquiry shifted to why did the tree collapse? in spite of the fact that it was uh, appearing to be a very strong tree. So why did it collapse? Well, you know, it, it, it almost died, you know. So, uh, so what happened? So this led to this entire study, like uh, there was an effort to find out uh, uh, what was the reason behind the uh, damage to trees in this uh, cyclone prone area. Now Vishakapatnam is prone to cyclones. Um, every year in the Bay of Bengal, we get around four to five cyclones. Some are minor, some are moderate. And it was the first time that we faced such a, a severe cyclone with the winds uh, ranging between 180 kilometers. If the wind speed increases beyond 180, if it goes up to 200, then it is classified as a super cyclone, like the one we had in um, Orissa. So, <laughs> Now, uh, one difference between a cyclone and an earthquake, you know, earthquake is a cataclysmic disaster. That means it occurs suddenly. And uh, many times it occurs right in the night. For example, a Latour earthquake, it occurred at uh, 12 o'clock in the night. And uh, you don't get time for, um, you know, protecting yourself because, you know, you get hardly one or two minutes uh, warning before an earthquake. Uh, 
but uh, in the case of a uh, cyclone you know a lot of uh, well developed uh, early warning systems are there and our uh, um, imd pune it has a very good early warning system and they could pinpoint with accuracy the exact date and time when the cyclone would be hitting uh, vizag and where exactly it would be making its uh, landfall so in essence what happens is you get a warning at least a week before or five days before uh, of course uh, sometimes what happens is uh, uh, one week before you get the warning but then in the last minute uh, the cyclone might change its path and instead of hitting vizag it might go off towards uh, you know orissa coast or somewhere like that so uh, that's what happened in the case of uh, filin so anyway once this early warning is given what happens is uh, there is a the opportunity to uh, carry out certain uh, improvements or make some modifications to certain things so that the damage can be minimized for example you can uh, shift people to uh, higher areas and uh, you know uh, during hudud almost 4 lakh people were evacuated and only 40 people uh, died whereas in the uh, super cyclone uh, almost 10000 people died now here what i'm trying to show you in this picture is like since they got a warning uh, one week before then the municipal corporation went around trimming the trees uh, many of these uh, 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 communication power lines are uh, overhead and uh, many tall trees are they are growing below the power line so what happens is these uh, um, branches and leaves they obstruct the um, electric lines and uh, you can see here so they went around trimming them giving the tree the haircut now uh, what happened as a result was the center of gravity got disturbed and when there was the actual cyclone many of these trees collapsed because of that so you can see some trees when they collapse you know like if there is a compound wall next to that uh, then uh, that damages the compound wall and if there are some other any objects by the side then they also get damaged so uh, what needs to be done is now of course in vizag they have uh, put all these electrical lines uh, underground so this problem has reduced but at that time uh, this uh, indiscriminate pruning led to lot of uh, collapse of many trees this is in a place called padavaltair and this is lawson's bay colony now uh, uh, if you study the aerodynamic response how trees uh, respond to cyclonic winds Uh, you will find that uh, many trees are uh, quite rigid and um, they try to withstand the wind and as the wind speed increases uh, one uh, technique that trees use is uh, they try to discard their leaves uh, if uh, the leaves are small they immediately get discarded or they sacrifice some of their limbs you know the like, like intentionally they allow a branch to get broken that reduces the stress on the plant one peculiar tree here which is uh, native to our uh, uh, state is this uh, um, coconut tree or palm tree so here what happens is um, uh, you can see that uh, it is very well adapted to the way it responds to strong cyclonic winds for example it has a single bud unlike the other trees which have number of branches coming out from the buds but here there is a single bud and all the leaves are held together in that bud and they are you know like uh, it's like something like a hinge joint you know they can uh, move according to the wind so here you can see the wind is coming from this side this is the uh, picture i took from my balcony uh, you know when the cyclone had started so uh, you can see the here all the leaves uh, sway this side and when the wind direction changes see here in vizag what happened was the eye of the cyclone uh, hit vizag so you know what happens when uh, the eye hits you know the wind direction uh, gets the reverse so sometimes you have uh, wind from one side sometimes you have wind from another side so here you can see it was coming from the other side and uh, some of the trees they were breaking but the coconut trees uh, survived now uh, how is this damage assessment carried out and what is the purpose the purpose of carrying out a damage assessment is to carry out something also known as a vulnerability assessment so this vulnerability assessment is done so that you can know uh, uh, you know which are the species or people or places that are vulnerable in the event of a disaster and uh, informed decisions can be taken at a later date Uh, when you are again doing some replanting then you have some uh, data that okay don't use this or use that particular thing now what are the types of damage 
So, see, earlier we were not aware of all these uh, types of damage and all because uh, this was not taught to us in our landscape design class. So, uh, all this had to be learned from experience. A uh, little bit of literature was available in uh, certain cyclones which occurred in uh, the US and uh, they were trying to document uh, this. So, this particular study was of interest to people, many people, because everyone is interested in knowing uh, what are the effects of a disaster or what are the uh, mitigation measures that have been carried out. So uh, this particular, uh, you know, number of papers resulted from this study. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, there were a thousand downloads. So why will thousand people download a particular paper? Because they're all interested. They're interested in knowing because this is a peculiar phenomenon and it is singular to a particular place. It doesn't repeat everywhere. So uh, and people are interested in knowing what happened in the case of a Buj earthquake uh, or a cyclone like uh, Hudud. So here, okay, so this uh, trees and shrubs in uh, cyclone areas, uh, basically we could find four, four particular types of damage. So first type is known as defoliation. So defoliation is something like what happens to a tree, a deciduous tree, you know, like uh, it sheds its leaves in uh, uh, winter and then uh, again the uh, foliage comes back. Uh, uh, so in the case of defoliation, uh, uh, the uh, leaves are shed and uh, uh, trees which can shed their leaves easily have a better chances of uh, survival. If the tree has a very big leaf and it's not prepared to shed it, then many times such trees will actually get uprooted. I'll show you some pictures of that. The second type of damage is uh, on a peculiar only to uh, coastal climates and that is damage from salt spray. In the beginning, you know what happened uh, just after the cyclone, uh, uh, everyone started commenting that many of the trees are dead and uh, the color of their leaves have become uh, dark brown and um, uh, they could not understand what's happening. So people started flocking to the botany department in uh, Andhra University. And there, you know, people, uh, the prof started telling that, okay, this is all salt spray damage. And um, then literature also showed that uh, the aerial drift uh, from the sea uh, carried this salt uh, spray uh, almost up till, you can even say up till 50 kilometers. So it's not just a coastal corridor, but nearby areas also. So it gets deposited on the leaves and that causes dehydration or necrosis. And uh, gradually if the roots are affected, uh, then the uh, plant might die. Now, what is the solution for this? Uh, and the next day, if there is a rainfall, then that washes off the salt spray. See, we saw in uh, the in uh, some cities, like in say, for example, in Bangkok, uh, they have a large, uh, uh, you know, uh, something like an artillery gun, which sprays water onto a, a huge tree and uh, gives it a shower bath. So uh, such type of things are not there in our country. But uh, if we use such things, then immediately after the cyclone, after the cyclone. All the trees should, if they get a shower bath, then uh, they have better chances of survival uh, because of this salt spray damage. Third thing is uh, wind throw and uprooting. So this depends on the aerodynamic response of the tree and uh, uh, how well it can withstand a particular uh, force, wind force. And it also depends on the uh, rooting pattern of the particular uh, tree, how deep the roots go. And uh, it also, of course, depends on the branching pattern. So that we're coming to the next one. Um, uh, okay, this wind throw also depends on the height of the tree and it depends on the slenderness ratio. So we have some trees, for example, in our campus, I'll show you some trees like um, Swetanya Mahagoni. So it's a very tall tree, but it has a very, uh, you know, like a thin stem and the slenderness ratio is so high that you just give it a push, it'll collapse. And its roots are also not, uh, they don't go deep down. So such trees should not be used in cyclone prone areas. Then uh, you have damage to co-dominant stems. So I'll explain to you uh, from the picture what is meant by a co-dominant stem. Uh, so in the case of defoliation, uh, we could identify certain types of trees like, uh, you know, Samania Saman, that's known as the common name of the rain tree, then Ficus religious, uh, that's a people tree, then the neem tree, then Spathodina campanulata. All these, uh, they shed their leaves and branches and that reduces the stress on them. 
then uh, the greater the wind speed the more leaves are shed uh, uh, but then one should not uh, feel that the tree is dead it's just like you know uh, you are losing your hair and then again you may get back your hair so something like that um, so uh, actually what happened was at that time uh, we could uh, see this uh, def uh, refoliation only after maybe a period of 2 weeks so till then everyone thought that most of the trees are dead and the first trees that were uh, refoliated were basically this badam trees uh, um, terminella petapa then pongamaya glabra and then uh, this ficus religiosa ficus religiosa has a very small leaves so uh, you know it sheds the leaves and then uh, immediately say you can see here this is a ficus uh, religiosa tree uh, in a place called rishikonda near our campus um, next to our uh, university building so uh, this entire all the leaves this was just uh, day after the cyclone uh, see there is something called golden hour if you study immediately after a disaster then you can get all the information if it, if you study after one month or so then by that time uh, most of the evidence will be gone so here you can see just after a day the all the leaves were shed and uh, then this is after a couple of weeks uh, uh, you can see this all the foliage has come back so this is uh, refoliation now this is a um, uh, neem tree in our campus uh, where, which had uh, shed all its leaves and because the leaves are quite small but the same um, in the campus again we have a park called nightingale park in which uh, you have lot of teak trees so these teak trees uh, leaves are very broad and they don't shed their leaves so you could see that uh, we could see many of the trees uh, were just uprooted because they were offering too much of uh, resistance to the wind speed now this i told you about the salt spray damage so uh, when the droplets evaporate then the salt penetrates into the stems buds and leaves and uh, you know it causes dehydration so all of you know about dehydration this is exactly what happens to the tree and uh, it gets salt burned so there is something called uh, leaf necrosis or even the marginal leaf around the leaf you know the border gets completely uh, brown and uh, uh, gradually the leaves will drop and then the sap will come out and uh, finally the uh, tree dies so you can see this is an example of uh, salt spray damage to uh, on the left hand side these are uh, calophyllum inophyllum trees uh, so all their uh, they were quite susceptible to salt spray damage in areas where they were exposed to the salt spray where the trees are located or sheltered not much damage was observed but uh, in other areas uh, they suffered from salt spray damage and uh, to validate uh, this findings uh, we did a study of uh, damage to same type of trees in different parts kal hone wala hai kal anuman ko maine kaha tha aap ek kaam karo na jay keshav sir ka wo list forward kar do likh do baki sab kal aayega fir wo nahi keh payenge ki hum sombar bhi nahi dete kya kiya pata nahi ha ओके आई फॉरगॉट व्हाट आई वाज टेलिंग आई वाज लिसनिंग टू समवन आई फॉरगॉट व्हाट आई वाज टेलिंग एनीवे ओके सो दिस सेम टाइप ऑफ ट्रीज वी कुड सी द सेम टाइप ऑफ डैमेज इन बुडा पार्क एंड कैनेटी पार्क एंड अदर प्लेसेस सो वन कांट जस्ट जंप टू कंक्लूजन बाय वन स्टडी वी नीड टू uh see the same type of damage and uh, repeated in other places then we can arrive at a conclusion so on the right hand side these are all uh, uh, tecoma uh, gaudi chaudi trees and you can see their um, leaves have all become brown this is a good example of uh, salt spray damage and this uh, calophyllum inophyllum tree you can see these are the leaves uh, you know before the cyclone uh, very nice uh, Uh, rubbery type of leaf with a yellow color uh, uh, you know central line and uh, this is how they become after the salt spray gets deposited on the leaves gradually the uh, entire leaf uh, gets damaged not only trees but even shrubs you can see these are uh, really a bush shrub so uh, all this side of the shrubs you know they were uh, completely damaged by salt spray so now which are the trees which are resistant yeah, to salt spray damage that type of study was also done yeah. uh, there are no questions for akina 
this is in a park in uh, called Tenetti Park, uh, showing the salt spray damage. This is for a rubber plant, and this is a Bahunia variegata plant which, in Buddha Park, which got damaged by the salt spray. Now, this particular variety is very good, and uh, it has uh, pink color flowers and red color flowers. Bahunia blackena is a very attractive avenue tree, but uh, if you use that in this coastal climate, uh, then because of the salt spray damage, uh, it, it will get completely damaged. So we should not use this particular tree extensively here. Then another thing is, uh, I told you about co-dominant stems. Now, uh, many times you have a single stem for a tree. Like for example, this is a um, Arcaria tree uh, and it has a single stem. So single stems, uh, they stand a better chance of survival. Whereas a co-dominant stem is, you know, like three or four stems of equal diameter starting from the main stem. And what happens is uh, they, they are very susceptible to damage. This is uh, the way uh, the problem is at the joint where the two stems meet, they, at the crotch, uh, you get something called uh, inferior quality bark that is called included bark. And this is not strong wood. So what happens is if uh, uh, you know there is a heavy wind force, then uh, it, uh, the tree snaps and breaks at these particular joints. Uh, so several experiments have been carried out where they tied the uh, branches of the tree with ropes to two different cars and they were pulled and immediately the trees collapsed. Uh, so you can see this is in our, uh, behind the architecture building in a campus where uh, this is a Pongamia uh, pinata tree. Uh, you can see this um, you know, like, uh, entire thing is totally broken. These are all co-dominant stems. And uh, uh, see, this is a ficus religiosa tree, um, which uh, got damaged along the beach road uh, en route to Bimli Patnam. So, uh, you know, like uh, uh, you can clearly see this, uh, this is uh, the dark brown patch. This is included the bark. And because of this, uh, this branch is totally broken. These are all co-dominant stems. So there are hundreds of trees like this, which uh, were totally damaged because of this uh, cyclone. Now I told you about uh, tall slender trees. Many times uh, uh, there, there's something called top heavy trees. Top heavy trees means uh, the foliage is there on the top and um, that makes the tree top heavy. For example, uh, many of the palms survive very well, but there is one type of palm called um, Cariota urens uh, that is called a fishtail palm. So it has a very, um, it is very top heavy and many of these uh, uh, species uh, got damaged. Now see, this is um, the architecture building in our campus. And uh, uh, we have a lot of um, Spathodia campanulata trees. Like, uh, you know, I told you about this tree where miners would be coming, parrots would be coming and all. So all these trees uh, uh, totally collapsed. Uh, these are exotic trees and uh, they have very uh, shallow roots. And, um, you know, like uh, they're the first victims in uh, uh, cyclone. Now these are, um, what, ha what happens when uh, these trees uh, fall on top of buildings? For example, in uh, the campus in Andhra University, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, eucalyptus trees and these are quite heavy and uh, very tall trees. So many of them uh, collapsed on top of buildings. So you could see this entire building is crushed by these trees. And uh, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, eucalyptus trees collapsed all around the campus. Now this is an um, example uh, of a small building in the Andhra University campus in the uh, canteen building. So you know, huge uh, eucalyptus tree uh, it uh, got uprooted and it fell on top of that and it damaged the roof completely. Now here you can see uh, this is a tree uh, with branches which are broken and there's a bench below. This is the Buddha Park in Vishakhapatnam. It's uh, the biggest park in uh, Vizag. Uh, more than 50 acres, uh, 100 acres, sorry, uh, uh, five, sorry, more than 500 acres. And, uh, um, you know, it's dangerous to have benches below these type of trees. Normally we put the benches to get shade, but in cyclone forum areas, we have to think again. Um, so this is a uh, uh, lot of trees uh, 
uh, with shallow roots, uh, they were simply uprooted because of the wind force. So there is a very brittle uh, type of tree which is used extensively for uh, afforestation. Uh, on all the hills in Vizag, they were forested with this Acacia auriculiformis. So uh, it has attractive yellow flowers, but then uh, they are very brittle, uh, and uh, many of them got uprooted. Now, this is another very nice, uh, uh, important tree called Thespesia populnia. So this Thespesia populnia has yellow flowers, and it is resistant to salt spray, and it grows very well in coastal climates. But then it's not very strong. Um, this is quite a young tree, so it has uh, got overturned, but uh, when it becomes mature, it becomes pretty strong. Now, see, this is um, another uh, Pongamia Pinata tree uh, next, uh, next to our campus uh, architecture building. This is a mechanical engineering building. So you can see the broken branches are still there. So unless these are removed, uh, they become uh, sources of danger for uh, people who are passing by. Now, I told you, um, you know, a lot of hardscape elements also get damaged. For example, lampposts along the Beamley corridor, many of the lampposts uh, got damaged. Then uh, street furniture, uh, the benches in the park. See, what happens if you put a street light, uh, um, street la lamppost next to a bench in a cyclone prone area? It might just collapse. So it's a bit dangerous. So uh, at least you should keep it uh, uh, six feet away or 10 feet away from a bench. Then many times, you know, like um, the slabs got damaged, a lot of damage to street furniture. So you need to do a rethink on uh, the type of uh, furniture that you're going to provide in uh, this coastal climate. So maybe furniture that can easily be replaced, you know, that is one philosophy in earthquake design, like a building should, can suffer moderate damage. For example, uh, certain elements of the building can uh, be repaired after the, uh, earthquake or uh, you know. then again a lot of hardscape elements like pavements uh, uh, the beach road uh, there's a lot of damage to pavements and many trees which are planted you know uh, paving is done after the trees are uh, uh, grown up so what they do is uh, uh, they, many times the roots get cut off and when the roots get cut off because of this paving then in the event of a cyclonic wind, uh, these trees collapse and many, many times they fall on top of the wall and they damage the walls also. Now, uh, after doing this entire study, we carried out a complete, uh, we prepared a database, a database of uh, all the different types of trees uh, that, uh, and uh, what type of damage they suffered. So the significance of this was that it uh, gives an architect uh, an idea what type of tree uh, to use in a cyclone prone area or not. And uh, for example, if the architect is uh, practicing somewhere and uh, like we had a specific case of architect working in Ahmedabad and he got a project for a park in Vizag and uh, one of their uh, office uh, um, persons working in his office had attended uh, uh, one of these um, conferences in Rurki where this paper was also presented. So he uh, went and told his boss, oh, oh, you can't use the same type of trees which we are using in Ahmedabad. So then they got in touch with us and uh, they were asking, we gave them information, okay, don't use this tree, don't use that tree. And so this is an important database, uh, which uh, can be used for reference when you're uh, designing in cyclone prone areas. So uh, there was a separate uh, assessment was done for uh, all the trees in Geetam campus and also in, along the coastal corridor. Then uh, uh, now, uh, instead of, uh, we are talking only about the damage. Now, who are the, um, uh, you know, which are the trees which um, fared very well in the cyclone? So there are some trees which are highly wind resistant. For example, there are some palms like this uh, champagne palm uh, or bottle palm. So because of its aerodynamic shape, uh, most of these, uh, even in the parks, in Kennedy Park and other parks, they could uh, withstand the cyclone. Then, uh, like you can see these trees, like uh, this is Vichy Merili and um, uh, Arcaria bamboo. Uh, bamboo is also very good. And also you have foxtail palm. Uh, that's also very good in cyclone prone areas. Then along the uh, coast, like what are the trees which are actually growing on the coast? So these are the trees which adapt very well to the coastal climate. So you have a lot of this uh, um, boracus uh, flab uh, lifer. This is uh, the palm, which is very 
common in uh, Vishakapatnam. Then you also have this uh, cassia biflora shrubs. You know, they have yellow flowers and they're uh, growing widely along the coast. And uh, nerium oleander, we found this nerium oleander to be highly resistant to salt spray. And uh, it is planted in medians along the uh, roads. And uh, it should be the first choice uh, in the cyclone prone areas. And it has, a, a, you know, you get a dwarf variety also. And you get um, plants with the white color flowers and pink color flowers, red color flowers. So it's one of the good varieties to use in the cyclone prone areas. Then another thing we observed was uh, a lot of indigenous ground covers. Um, for example, uh, uh, Ipomia is a good, uh, a lot of creepers in Ipomia. For example, you have Ipomia chatarus, which we normally use uh, because of its foliage. Uh, now here you have uh, uh, this Ipomia uh, pesca capre. Uh, it has very nice leaves and also it gets uh, good flowers and it grows wild and uh, it's uh, totally salt resistant. Uh, there's another creeper which grows along the Bimli coast. Now the problem is that the corporation, um, you know, they took up some beautification schemes along the beach and they removed all these uh, ground covers. Um, now what happened was um, one major problem in the Vizac coast is the beach erosion. And these ground covers, uh, uh, you know, we recommend that they should again be replanted uh, to prevent this uh, uh, erosion of the beach. and. Uh, these are, uh, you know, more or less, they have become indigenous to uh, the Vishakapatnam climate. Another important uh, uh, planting is uh, shelter belt. For example, this Kajurina shelter belts earlier, uh, you know, they provide the first line of defense uh, in the event of a cyclone. Um, many of the shelter belts which were earlier there in the Vishakapatnam uh, coastal corridor, again, they were also removed. I, I don't know why. And uh, uh, many of them, you know, they were cut by the fishermen uh, who lost their uh, houses and they took a temporary uh, shelter below these trees and also they started uh, cutting this uh, wood for firewood. As a result, many of the shelter belts got damaged. So the shelter belts in two, uh, two rows should be planted because they provide the first line of defense in the event of a cyclone. Now, uh, for uh, any cyclone, you know, there are basically three stages. One is a pre-disaster where you can carry out certain operations, like I told you in the beginning. Then you have um, uh, uh, post-disaster. During disaster, of course, it's very difficult to go out because things are getting damaged. Then after disaster, what happens? The first thing is a lot of debris gets uh, deposited all across the roads and um, you know in the thoroughfares and also the operation of uh, debris clearance has to take place. So this was done in uh, our Geetam campus. A lot of uh, trees were uh, broken and all the faculty were uh, completely involved in uh, clearing the debris, uh, including the uh, vice chancellor and registrar also uh, participated in this um, uh, debris clearance project. And um, many of the trees, you know, the very heavy branches, so they had to be lifted and they had to be carried out and, uh, then uh, there were organizations like N uh, NSS, so they took an active part in uh, cleaning, uh, removing the debris. Then another important thing is a lot of carpenters were involved in uh, cutting off the trees which were partially damaged because uh, they pose danger to people who are passing by. Another important point that you should note is in the event of a cyclone, you get an early warning. So uh, one thing that any campus uh, or uh, people uh, in residences have to do is they should remove the uh, coconuts from the trees. That is called denutting. Otherwise, these coconuts uh, become like missiles, you know, and uh, they may uh, just uh, become dangerous for people who are passing. Them. Then uh, after this debris clearance, uh, what is the next step? Next step is like uh, you need to restore uh, uh, trees that are damaged. You know, like uh, there are some trees which uh, uh, suffer minor damage, so they'll uh, get back their foliage or they get back their branches after some time. But there are some trees which uh, suffer major damage, like they get completely uprooted. Even such trees can be um, restored, um, but it takes time. So uh, we, I'll show you some examples. Say, for example, this is the architecture campus where we had around four uh, Graviella robusta trees. 
and uh, you know these are called silver oak uh, so all these trees uh, collapsed completely they got uprooted and then uh, you know they were all uh, staked uh, you, uh, they were up, uh, lifted up and staked and uh, now you can see these uh, trees with all these stakes and uh, uh, so now after the stakes are uh, uh, you know here you can see the stakes have been removed so uh, now you when you see the tree you don't know that it it was completely uh, restored i mean it, it was completely uprooted and um, you know its life was saved it got uh, restored uh, so this type of operations uh, uh, if they are done then they can help in uh, bringing them giving life back to some other trees uh, see we have lot of uh, mahogany trees there is a uh, there are two parks uh, these trees actually they are um, having very tall uh, stems very slender uh, stems and at the same time shallow roots so in the event of cyclone you can see a lot of damage many of them collapse so they were all um, most of them were lifted up and again they were restored uh, but uh, best idea would be not to plant this type of trees in cyclone prone areas then uh, uh, other type of trees like um, calophyllum minophyllum they were all uh, uh, staked and restored then this is an interesting uh, case uh, in a, a small uh, ashram called shanti ashram uh, along the near lawson's bay in uh, visakhapatnam uh, where there was a huge uh, uh, ficus religiosa tree all of you are aware that ficus religiosa is a worship in uh, indian context like you find this tree in the premises of temples and uh, the tree is worship that's why it's called ficus religiosa and uh, this entire tree had uh, collapsed so the uh, owner of that ashram he uh, wanted it to be restored so a lot of efforts were done and the entire tree uh, uh, has been restored and now nobody knows that it had uh, collapsed so i'll come to the conclusion uh, what you need to do is uh, you need to do a survey of the trees before and after the cyclonic storm uh, if you do it before then uh, you can uh, take certain measures for safeguarding the trees and uh, so the inspection will reveal uh, uh, there is something called structural pruning so the structural pruning should be carefully carried out and that will uh, reduce the chances of the collapse of the tree so for this you require some uh, machines uh, like uh, something like a, a crane type of thing where a person can uh, sit on that and uh, he, he can be lifted up till the top of the tree and he can give uh, prune the branches that is called structural pruning and um, then what are the type of trees that you need to select they should be wind resistant they should have a stable architecture and they should be salt resistant and they should have deep roots so uh, pre disaster and post disaster assessment damage to trees uh, coupled with what i told you structural pruning and uh, suitable conservation measures uh, would help in making landscape safe resilient and sustainable so these are some of the uh, references which were uh, papers that were referred in the course of the study so uh, so this is the end thank you very much so uh, i'll remove the uh, thank you professor mohan uh, sir sunil sir you are not uh, uh, yeah yeah i'm just unmuting yeah Uh, sir thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation sir like which covered uh, the whole uh, gamut of uh, how landscape uh, uh, it's not just uh, the design uh, it is so much so much that goes uh, behind the uh, landscaping and especially when we are thinking at a level of uh, urban level the landscaping what should be the uh, basis of uh, selecting uh, landscape material uh, it, it was uh, you know, very well researched uh, presentation that you have done sir thank you so much for sharing all this for with us sir. thank you thank you hema are there any questions uh, i don't see any questions sir
so if you have, if anyone has any question you can unmute yourself and ask uh, professor mohan your questions yesterday the whole day the sessions were uh, like uh, limited to one of the most important aspects of architecture that is the uh, built environment like how the buildings have to be and the water what is important as an architect with uh, to respond to the environment change and the, today the whole sessions that uh, we will be having like uh, along with this uh, the other session or in the afternoon also it's at urban level uh, right now uh, professor mohan talked about uh, uh, the trees and landscaping at an urban at urban level and uh, in the afternoon session also there is something uh, at that level urban heat islands so the second day would be a little different from what it was yesterday like uh, <clears throat> i think there should be some questions to professor mohan because the uh, uh, the subject he has touched upon this uh, uh, like landscape architecture disaster management right so very new to architects so i think there should be some questions from some of you Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, my name is Vishali. Uh, sir, actually, I don't have any question, but I want. Uh, uh, actually, I am uh, uh, one of the student of uh, uh, Professor K. Mohan, sir. Uh, sir, good morning, sir. I am from Chit Ramtek uh, in 1999 batch. uh you are my guide in my thesis topic, Children's Hospital. <laughs> By the <laughs> sir. <laughs> Uh, I I find you in this uh, FDP. Just uh, I saw your name and decided to attend this FDP to see you again in many lots of years. That's why I attend to just only to see you and say good morning or uh, uh, just like to wish you, sir. Okay, nice. I am very. <laughs> uh, sir, I am very happy to see you here, sir. Can you uh, show your face? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, I think you didn't recognize me because uh, I am very shy type of student that time. <laughs> I am okay. I am from 1999 batch, sir. Yeah, Kids Ram Tech. Uh, we have uh, two students who are doing their uh, masters in sustainable architecture. Um, they study yeah. uh, Aditya and uh, his brother. They are twins actually, and uh, I remember okay. Kids Ram Tech. Because uh, we did the uh, landscaping there, one plantation next to the boys' hostel. Three yeah. Months. Currently, I am pursuing PhD uh, from AKTU uh, Lucknow, and my topic is uh, just uh, uh, matching with this. Uh, but it's from hilly areas. I take uh, uh, climate responsive architecture in hilly areas. Uh, 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 with relation to, uh, I think uh, vernacular architecture is over there in hilly areas. so that's why uh, uh, i am attending this okay nice meeting you thank you, yeah. thank you sir okay sir all the best for you for your phd ah uh, yes sir all Pardon, the best sir? for your phd oh thank you thank you sir thank you sir yeah thank you sir <laughs> yeah any more anyone anyone with uh, any questions Do you, do you want to talk? How many participants are there totally? There are fifty-eight. Fifty-eight, sir. Fifty-eight. Uh, so fifty-five. Hello, sir. Yeah, Nivedita. Yes, hello, sir. Good morning. Uh, I am from Tamil Nadu. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had done a very similar uh, study for the coastal belt of Nagapattinam to Thoothukudi. Uh, I had never seen the pictures as you had shown. I didn't know the scale of impact the uh, cyclones cause. It was very insightful, and I could actually have a deeper understanding about the topic. I feel very grateful that for the presentation, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Good. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you can. Uh, 
look into the pictures published in local newspapers maybe you can uh, figure out few images uh, that reflect uh, the damage that was done to landscape in whatever the study that you have done maybe you can go back and look at some uh, information uh, like for some photographs as you have now seen yeah a lot of uh, pictures uh, the kind of the damage that happens so maybe you would be able to recognize them now easily but then visually looking at it the next day of impact is very eye-opening. Yeah, your, your, your uh, internet connection is uh, very weak, I think. So we are not able to hear you uh, clearly, Nivedita. All right. So there was one question. Uh, are there any specific vegetation for uh, coal belts? OK. Uh, see, like here, I like to tell you, when you're talking of coal belts, um, you have a lot of um, coal belts, like you have Charia and uh, Dhanbad and all these where, uh, you know, you have a lot of coal belts. And one of the major problems in this coal belts is like, uh, um, a lot of this uh, coal dust gets deposited and many people, uh, uh, it goes into the lungs also. It's, uh, that is one of the major uh, problems. So here uh, we talk about uh, one role of trees. Um, that is a role of trees uh, for resisting uh, pollutants. For example, there are certain types of trees which uh, can resist sulfur dioxide and uh, they are planted uh, in industries and the areas. So there are a lot of species. Uh, for example, um, uh, in um, uh, Ramtek itself, we had uh, um, uh, Arcaria trees uh, and shrubs. Uh, so the leaves are uh, very tightly held together and uh, the pollutants get uh, deposited in them. Another example is, uh, um, uh, I'll give, give an example from Nagpur. Uh, in Nagpur, there is a women's uh, college called LED College. So once we went and we were doing a study of a park called Ambazari Park. And uh, when we are going in the bus, we uh, uh, crossed this area called Seminary Hills where this uh, girls college is located. And uh, adjacent to that, there's a big plantation of teak trees. Now what uh, some of the um, uh, students were uh, you know, saying was these trees are looking very bad. Um, why they're looking bad is that all their leaves are completely brown. Uh, why they became brown is they're covered with dust. So what happens is there are certain types of uh, plants with leaves which have uh, uh, leaves which have uh, very minute hairs. So these hairs, um, uh, you know, they trap the dust particles. And uh, this uh, Tectona grandis, for example, is, uh, that has a very large leaf. The size of the leaf is very large and it has hairs, so uh, that uh, absorbs this uh, dust. So in parks and all, uh, dust control uh, by trees is an important uh, consideration. And like uh, what uh, the person is asking uh, in coal belts, so these are some of the species which uh, um, you know can be used. Now here you must remember that when you are uh, talking about plants which are resisting pollutants, uh, people think that, okay, I use this particular uh, tree and it will absorb the pollutants. There are a lot of studies out there where they have, uh, you know, like they have planted trees uh, uh, in areas where a lot of pollutants are released. For example, you take a traffic island. You know, in a traffic island, so when you slow down, when you're turning that time, you know, or you're accelerating, uh, that time a lot of, um, uh, you know, exhaust from the vehicles and all, a lot of pollutants uh, 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 get deposited. So in such areas, it's very important to select plants uh, which can absorb these type of uh, vehicular pollution. And uh, what people think is you just put the plant and it will um, uh, resist this type of thing and uh, not, damage will not occur to the plant. It's not that. You know, uh, even the trees get completely stressed and they may die. They can, uh, you know, uh, they can incur a lot of damage. The trees will get stressed but it's like, you know, uh, among people, some people are more uh, immune to cold and some people catch cold very easily. 
So uh, if you select a person who is uh, having better immunity, uh, then that person can, uh, it's something like that. So you select uh, trees which are more resistant to dust and uh, you know, uh, less susceptible to uh, damage. So uh, there is a list of trees. So uh, pollution resistant trees, a big list is there. If you want, I can share with you afterwards. So this is important and especially in urban areas where you have a lot of uh, air pollution. So there uh, in industrial areas, uh, we use these type of trees. And a major pollutant there is sulfur dioxide. So uh, sulfur dioxide resistant trees are, you know, uh, much in demand. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there was another question uh, by studying cyclone affected areas. We should plant cyclone uh, uh, resilient trees. Why is it not being implemented? Why is it not being implemented? Okay, this is a very good question. Uh, what happened immediately after? What happened immediately after the cyclone? See, these things were not known to us earlier. I never knew all these things. Uh, it was only after I, uh, after the cyclone, uh, uh, you know, I went around and started photographing and doing the study. In fact, the study had to be done at what time? You know, between five. Uh, uh, one had to get up at four thirty in the morning and start by five o'clock in the car and go towards Bimli Patnam and uh, return back uh, before uh, 8 o'clock because our uh, uh, university starts by 9 o'clock and you have the biometric system. If you come one minute late, then you're marked absent and your salary is cut. So in a very disciplined manner, the entire survey had to be done. And uh, like I told you, like uh, it had to be done immediately after the cyclone. So uh, all these things we could uh, slowly uh, get by observation. Now, after this, uh, uh, what happened? Um, when we tell something that, okay, don't use this tree, don't use that tree, then what happens is many people, they feel they're experts and they don't want to take advice from other people. And it so happened in our own case, in the case of Geetam University, uh, we have a park called Tenneti Park and uh, our uh, alumni, alumni of Geetam, they adopted this particular park and uh, there was extensive damage to the park and uh, many of the trees collapsed. And the chief minister, he came and visited uh, Vishakhapatnam and um, there was a replanting scheme and uh, along with all the high officials and uh, the chief minister came, uh, that was uh, uh, our, uh, Sunil, what's his name? Chandrababu Naidu. Yeah, yeah, Chandrababu Naidu came <laughs> and uh, he, uh, so uh, now what happened, our um, uh, landscape uh, um, uh, our people asked uh, advice from uh, uh, architecture people. Uh, okay, what type of trees uh, we have to give to the chief minister for planting? So I came to know that they had selected Bahonia variegata and uh, they purchased around 35 Bahonia variegata uh, plants and then uh, registrar, vice chancellor, chief minister, uh, that minister, this minister, everybody planted one of those trees. So I just said, don't put that, it will die. They said, uh, then I told our vice chancellor also, uh, please remove those trees and uh, put them somewhere else. He said, how can you remove the tree planted by chief minister? So then uh, what happened was uh, we did another study. This was an interesting study and our registrar was also uh, apprised of this. I said, okay, you're not removing the tree. So now let's do one thing. We'll do a study of the tree. We'll study how the tree is dying slowly, different stages of death of that particular tree. And then... Uh, uh, registrar used to go for a morning uh, walk and uh, NSS uh, program he used to visit that park. Then one day he came to me and told me, hey, there are some trees which are uh, dying and all that. And I said, yeah, I told you long back they'll die. Then uh, we went and started taking photographs. And all these trees which were planted by all the dignitaries, one by one, uh, they were totally damaged by salt spray. The leaves, um, the first the flowers all fell off, then all the leaves dropped off. Then uh, finally the entire tree was dead. Only thing that was left was that uh, play card, uh, um, uh, this bounty planted, planted by the chief minister. So that was the hole was there. They removed all those play cards. Also. So uh, this is one example. Second example is there are a lot of corporate uh, uh, firms, uh, big, big, uh, like steel <laughs> plant, and uh, uh, they started uh, getting a lot of plants from Kadiam. 
and uh, in kadiam you know they had lots of uh, trees which uh, nobody was buying and uh, so they started uh, giving off all these trees and people started purchasing them left and right and uh, many of these ngos started bringing in them and there was a huge uh, tree planting uh, festival where everyone goes and says okay i have planted five trees now what are the trees which they started planting you know they are all uh, ficus religiosa trees and they brought this ficus religiosa trees and started planting in the small five feet spaces uh, in apartments also so what happens this uh, tree its roots uh, this tree becomes very huge and all the roots will go and damage the foundation of this uh, apartment so the thing is uh, without proper information uh, and uh, these uh, trees were all being uh, given free of cost by this corporations and the municipality also started distributing so uh, that was because of uh, uh, lack of uh, um, because of ignorance or lack of proper idea uh, which type of trees are suitable for planting even when you know something should not be done people do it because they don't want to listen to other people they think they know everything this is the reason say for a simple example i tell my students who are going abroad there are certain colleges don't go there you will have problem if you go there but still they go there <laughs> they say I, uh, i got admission there i'm going there <laughs> and afterwards they face the problem okay anything else or uh, yeah am i any more questions anyway today we got more questions i, I never get any questions from my student <laughs> So actually, the coal, uh, yeah, coal bills question was for from uh, Jyoti, ma'am. Ah, she is from uh, this thing, Sindri. <laughs> okay, she was my first student from uh, this Pilumodi College. She is a very senior um, architect. <clears throat> Uh, so okay, any Sunil, other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Sir. Huh? There are no more questions, sir. I think so. Yeah. Okay. One one more thing. What I want to tell is uh, this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, all the pictures are uh, my own pictures. So okay. if anyone wants, they can use them, but they should acknowledge yes, because. Uh, that's a very simple thing to do when you're writing any technical paper and uh, right. because it's not possible for you to you cannot repeat who do okay yes, and, uh, <laughs> what happened is uh, happened and you know uh, even uh, for example the architects in wizac uh, they woke up uh, one month after the cyclone you know and they said let's do a study come on let's go and uh, see how the trees are damaged and this and that and you know like i told you there's something called golden hour Yes. golden hour is just immediately after the disaster suppose there is an accident for example if you immediately take some action after that then there are chances of survival a person can be rescued but uh, if you go <laughs> after one month then nothing will be there for example there is one hotel along the beach called uh, ambika sea green and um, when we studied all the buildings damage to the buildings because the architects are more interested in damage to the building mm -hmm. so there this entire wall of this um, ambika sea green Uh, which was made of glass that entire wall collapsed in the night uh, they got, it got shattered and um, we took some photographs of uh, that uh, when it got shattered then there's a park uh, um, called victory park in which a mig aeroplane is there you know so that aeroplane also collapsed so uh, then but then the navy doesn't want to show that uh, you know its mig plane collapsed uh, in the cyclone so they immediately removed it then the sambika sea green uh, they within uh, maybe 15 days they completely replaced the entire uh, uh, wall so today if someone <clears throat> goes there he never knows that this type of damage occurred so only there are certain trees which uh, where the scars are evident but uh, you should be able to recognize that scar where the codominant uh, uh, branches broke off so there you will find a hole there uh, so like that uh, uh, the damage has to be studied immediately so after one month when they started nothing was there and the wizag is highly resilient initially you know if you if you see the if you could see the pictures uh, of the damage at that time for example everyone must be familiar with the damage to the airport building in visakhapatnam you know the entire false ceiling collapsed luckily they had to close the airport uh, 
uh, you know five days before uh, if it was open then a lot of lives would have been lost the entire frame was intact but the false ceiling uh, completely collapsed because of poor workmanship Uh, I don't think there are any more questions. Actually, so, what you should what you should do in such FDP, no? Hmm. You give one mark for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Then people start asking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Sanil, so should we uh, yeah, yeah, we, we take a photograph? Like, yeah, uh, well. we will take the photograph. So, participants, please turn on your uh, uh, videos for a quick photograph. <clears throat> Our next speaker, Harshu Gupta sir, is also here. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Rashi Gupta. Good, good morning, Sunil sir and uh, Hammer. Thank you so yeah. much for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, uh, participants who have uh, their names as iPhone or uh, Acer computer, yeah, they can rename themselves. <laughs> So that way it would be uh, good. <clears throat> yeah, we have so many people who have not switched on their videos. Jaya Bharati, Rupina, Sindhu, Sri. Minu Pradeep, Bhaishali Pradhan, Dibini Amal. So please switch on your video so that uh, <clears throat> this is for the documentation for Atal. Prashant Chauhan. <clears throat> Mehfuz Rahman, Abhirami, Ramya B. We still have an Acer here. Emma, are we done? Just a minute, sir. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Today we didn't had a question from Dr. Naveen. Yesterday, there were many questions from Dr. Naveen Kishore. <laughs> yes, we are done. We are done? Okay. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, sir, thank you, Mohan, sir, for taking time uh, and uh, giving such a good presentation. Okay, I thank, hope you. This... thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Okay, yeah. bye. Yeah, thank you. Then leave now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ashugupta is also here, who is our next speaker. <laughs> uh, sir, uh, uh, since the uh, session is just done, we'll just give them a 10 minute break and we'll come back by 11 30. Sure, no problem. We'll see that. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. All 
I know it's a painful process, but uh, it's it needs to be done. Sorry. <laughs>
<coughs> yeah, Emma, we, I think we should start. I think everyone is here, so we'll start. Okay. Out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, welcome back. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Ashok Gupta, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ashok Gupta sir is going to uh, talk about green buildings uh, and rating systems. Uh, so let me give you a brief introduction about uh, Mr. Gupta sir. Uh, so Mr. Ashok Gupta's career spans over uh, several diverse domains. He commenced his career as a mechanical engineer in 2008. Uh, he is now the managing partner of Design to Occupancy Services. Uh, being associated with the most prestigious organization, he serves with complete devotion and perseverance on various exalted uh, leading positions for ISHRE, ASHRE, FSAI, IAQA, IBIPSA, uh, ISLE, and <laughs> there are a lot, lot, lot more, uh, and at the at local as well as uh, national and international level, he is an IGBCAP, uh, PQP, uh, GEMCP, and also a certified uh, ECBC master trainer. Uh, he loves to share his knowledge, and he has trained many, many architects, engineers, consultants, and government officials about energy building, uh, energy conservation building code ECBC. He is a National Apex Advocacy Vice Chair at ISHRE and a member of ASHRE uh, RAL uh, Webinar Support Committee and Conference and Exposition Committee. He is the Vice Chair of uh, Fire Suraksha Index by FSAI. And I'm sure there are a lot more. Uh, that's what is my understanding. And uh, D2O is also doing a lot of knowledge sharing. And uh, I've been... Uh, privileged to be part of one of the knowledge sharing uh, events. Uh, yes, uh, welcome, sir. Uh, thank you for accepting our request and uh, presenting today. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. You can take it over. Thank you. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Emma. And uh, I think my voice is uh, audible to everyone and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so just give me a confirmation that my screen is visible too, right? Emma, can you just confirm me? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, perfect. Great. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think the Hema has given me a great introduction uh, about myself. So, in in a small way, that I am I am a engineer, of course, as a mechanical engineer from uh, by the education. But I'm working in the building industry since last twelve years for the environmental friendly buildings in around the globe. I have experienced in not only in India, in major part in the US. I have been working there. And uh, I have designed so many buildings, which are uh, some of the lead platinum, Griha five star or some kind of rating system. And of course my area, why as an engineer, my focus area, I'm very uh, much, much interested in the air conditioning system designing. And uh, I, I have trained more than 10,000 professionals in India on energy conservation building code, which is the Bureau of Energy Efficiency uh, code. So before going to dive on the, my presentation, I would just thank thanks to uh, Gitam University uh, uh, to inviting me on this platform. Of course, especially Hema, uh, I think she attended our one of the course from D two O Learning and AICT. Great, uh, uh, I think great sessions have everywhere is happening for FDP. I have been part of several FDPs uh, from AICT as well as the Council of Architecture uh, too. I have done training on that behalf. I am also an assessor for the AICT. Uh, uh, to do a green uh, expert for the green campus award they do every year. I am I am a I am an assessor for AICT. I have done so many assessment in several colleges in India uh, for that. Uh, so this is of course the brief background of mine. My today topic of course given me to to explain you about the green building and the rating system happening in India. What actually it is green building and of course I will focus on the ECBC code as well because. Uh, <clears throat> These things are not new in India. Everyone knows, everyone have heard somehow. But actually, when this is not a rocket science, when we go in the deep dive in this, we will understand this is actually we were 
doing since long in our country we were following these norms since long but so something happened the design and things has been changed but this is something i'm going to explain today so first of all i just want to highlight about this special program the faculty development program i really like the name the climate change and adaptive architecture the reason behind it uh, i am uh, i am very active in the several platforms on international level i am a consultant for undp on that way because i was reading a one article this decade 2020 to 2030 is the climate change decade and climate change is the more more worst than what we are faced what we have faced in last 6 months because of covid and every world is talking every country entire world in any country you go everyone is talking about the need to reduce and how the carbon emissions can reduce and how the architects plays a important role in that category this is something we need to understand because every single kwh of electricity whatever we generate or we consumes in our daily life that emit around 800 g to 900 g of carbon emission in the environment and which impact on the global warming and that is something we need to understand as an architect we design so many buildings and every building is consuming a lot of ener energy either it is electricity to or, or the gas and every consumption is impacting on the carbon emission and there is no boundary in the countries uh, like india and pakistan having a political boundary but doesn't have a environmental boundary if you consumes your carbon emission it will impact to the other country as well and this is something uh, entire world is focusing especially why india because india is in a developing stage right now it is not a developed country it's a developing stage right now we have to grow more and more we have to increase our production more and more and in the next few years our energy consumption is going to drastically our natural resources we will be using drastically because we have a huge population and that is the reason this concept we need to adopt in our design otherwise it will be too late otherwise it will be too late because there is a study saying by the un unfcc they they are saying that if we if we consumes our natural resources like this way by 2080 or 2019 the temperature outside will be the 4. Uh, more more than 4.5 degree centigrade will be increment and that is the reason everyone is talking to re to reduce the temperature by 1.5 degree so and building impacts a lot building impacts a lot because a lot of people think why building industry consumes a lot of energy but actually if you talk about the global energy consumption 40% energy goes in the buildings either it is a commercial building residential building 40% building go 40% energy goes in that buildings and building when we design or construct any building i think 40 50 years we do not demolish that building whatever the materials we are using in the an entire envelope side the heat gain will be more worse to worst every year because of the our our systems will be more older so that is the reason we need to understand what actually it is sustainable rating or the green building design in that way so that is for that is overview of my presentation how how i am going to cover in that so everyone knows we are a very uh, populous country of course after china we are around 1.38 billion people right now and it is increasing more that is estimated by 2050 we will be the first in the world and in on behalf of population the positive side of course population we have a lot of young minds and all this thing but the negative side every person needs natural resources energy water air everyone wants that and but we have a limited natural resources and how we are going to distribute among them and this is also a very very alarming situation because every person needs water which is the as per the national building code says 135 liter per day per capita if the population is used how the water will come so this is uh, this is some some of the negative facts on that side but uh, energy global energy markets if you look at the last 20 years or 30 years graph of energy consumption in india it is increasing in a big way we are generating also we will we are generating a more but the generation major generation is happening through the fossil fuels which is the coal and that impacts on your carbon emission and so we need we need to increase the clean energy in that way but uh, 
we cannot go entirely on the clean energy at this moment we are dependent on the coal so india sustainability building market when we talk about by 2022 it is the 10 billion uh, the of course the 10 billion square meet square foot when we talk about and the market valuation is will be 35 to 50 billion us dollar huge potential lot of technologies are doing every day the government is coming up with a lot of funding program on the innovative technologies to reduce the carbon emission either as a material side other it is a energy side or water side but this environmental uh, issues or a lot of innovative lot of uh, uh, technologies are working in this direction this is something is very good graph for all of you because most of you are an architect and as an architect lot of people think that india has been constructed what will happen how will the work will happen but this is the report by mckinsey uh in 2010 2010 the, the india has the 659 million square meter construction area as a commercial building and it is estimated by 2030 it will be the 1932 million meter square it is a huge whatever the india we are seeing right we were seeing in 2010 that was a 33% and the and a remaining 66% india need to be built up and there is a huge building construction infrastructure construction is happening around the around around, around our country and there is a huge demand as an architect as an engineer to understand but we need to change our approach how can we make the sustainable buildings how can we make the green buildings so it can impact on the carbon emission so just back to basics now though i am not going to go in more in that way the theoretical things but the green actually india was the green we were the green if you look at the 30 years back any building you designed or anywhere you lived you didn't required air conditioning you didn't required if you didn't required air conditioning you were feeling comfortable in those buildings 30 years back like i my i i have been fortunate to be in my grandfather's house and it was very good because properly ventilated though air conditioning was there and even i was feeling so comfortably what has been design has changed in last 20 30 years so we we are dependent on the i would say the physical system or the artificial systems on that so green building anyone say green building is mix up of the five elements of nature which is the jal vayu agni prathvi aakash and these are the five elements of nature if we save if we conserve these resources then during the building design or the building construction then our building is the green building actually if we conserve these resources then the building is green how it is so this is a graph I just want to show you in case because a lot of people are not aware there is a there is a one ministry called uh, ministry of power under that there is a there is a, a autonomous body which is the bureau of energy efficiency Uh, which is the, of course the uh, ministry of power under that that uh, and they have a lot of schemes in the energy efficiency is in india like uh, you have seen the led replacement program entirely you have seen the star labeling equipments every ac fridge tv whenever you purchase there is a star labeling is coming up there is a building rating like a uh, star labeled on the building also similarly they also have a ecbc code called energy conservation building code all these policies by the bureau of energy efficiency this was calculated last year around 90000 crore rupees savings in india you can see the 89000 crore 122 and this is a huge saving actually if you if you do just because i have seen several government buildings still in india if you go there there is a estimation 30 to 40 and percent energy saving you can easily achieve whatever the fans they are using whatever the systems they are using what kind of envelope they are using lot of wastage and the losses are happening and this is a bureau of energy efficiency is doing amazing work in that direction and people are getting more and more involved uh, of course earlier was electrical or the mechanical engineer was so much involved in the industry energy audit but now the architects will be involved for the building design as per the energy compliance i will go in more detail on the energy sec side but uh, this is something we need to force so life cycle of the building uh, we do the planning we do the construction we do the commissioning then operation and maintenance and then renovation 
and then again planning so this is entire life cycle of any building so we need to understand we need to go in each and every parameter how it can be more sustainable in that way so i told you the green building five components jal vayu agni prathvi akash similarly now we will go in more detail way the if you talk about any green certification program like igbc like greha or uh, lead certification all the programs are talking about on those parameters only they like these, these are these are the five parameters sustainable site and planning prathvi water efficiency jal energy efficiency agni building material resources part of the prathvi and indoor environmental quality when we talk about vayu so these all are the basic terms converted into english in these parameters how can we save all these parameters so this this is the mostly if you go for any certification these are the five components you will see in those uh, certification program so it uh, of course the overview of the green building related to the materials related to the light living space windows quiet uh, kitchens so i am going to detail in that so first come on the sustainable sites and planning green building says try to understand the intent of the program this says the first related to the prathvi when we talk sustainable site the first is the construction activity pollution control the reason behind it whenever you construct any building you lot of a uh, lot of soil get eroded which is called a soil erosion happen soil erosion happen and that is be because of that we our air quality outdoor air quality get lot of particulates from the sand like pm 2.5 or pm 10 and that can impact on your health and you can understand this as right now in delhi everyone is talking about air pollution and how this air pollution happen and air pollution one of the way one of the major cause of course major issue is from the construction of the building when the construction of the building happens then lot of soil gets eroded and it can of course it uh, lot lot of noise, lot of dis disturbance happen and second other parameter because the when you construct a site your soil is a top soil the 3 mm of the initial soil is your top soil which is a fertile soil and you lot of people doing agriculture uh they now these days we are making buildings at the agriculture land and it uh, will be to the similar way in the next 10 20 years the agriculture land will be out so that is the reason we need to preserve that soil otherwise we will be losing the entire fertile soil from our country and this credit talks about that what whenever we do excavation of any building we need to put that soil and place at one place and properly we can do the temporary vegetation either we can do we can keep that soil and use in the back filling of the building so this is something we need to do uh, during the and this is most of the green building rating system says that you need to keep the pictures you need to keep this uh, uh, best practices at the site level because sometimes what happens the truck are coming the vehicles are coming from inside or the outside gate the the soil gets go with the wheels whatever the vehicle wheels the soil will go with that so we need to we need to have a wheel washing pit at the site level so whenever the truck come or the vehicle come we need to clean that wheel so the soil get uh, dispersed there only so that that should not go from the one side to the other area so this is some some best practices the construction activity pollution credit criteria talks about it and some so these are the best management practices the second of course the third the second thing is they are talking about the basic amenities basic amenities try to understand the intent if your building when you are making any building it is very far from the com basic amenities like medical like uh, uh, grocery shop atm or something so you are your residents or your employees of those building will travel more on the vehicle they will pollute more pollution in the environment so green building criteria says if your basic amenities is very near by to the site you will get some point like they have the 10 some basic amenities if that is in the range of the 1 km 
we will get some points in the basic communities criteria it is not a mandatory criteria but they have some mandatory criteria requirement essential requirement and some are the prescriptive some of the credit requirement so basic communities talks about that thing if you go in the details but the intent behind it the people should not go far from the building to get something in that similarly the third uh, of course this terms you most of you have heard about it heat island reduction heat island very uh, i think we have seen the temperature difference in the urban areas and the rural areas and this is uh, because of the concrete uh, jungle we are making of the i would say the concrete building we are making and when we make these kind of buildings that emit heat also so how when we are constructing any building i how can we reduce that impact in our microclimatic area so that is something now these days uh, you have seen uh, when we do when we talk about the non roof area non roof area in the parking area we can put pavers with the open grid paving so 70% grass and 30% is concrete so entire area is not a concrete we are putting some grass area or some green area in that we need to improve we need to increase the landscape for the roof especially because the roof uh, impact a lot of uh, a uh, reflection when we talk about so we or or heat gain inside the building because your air conditioning load get increase when the direct heat is coming from the roof so heat island reduction talk about that whatever the heat uh, whatever the roof area we are using we should either use the green roof or either we can uh, now these days we can utilize the high sri paint which is called the solar reflective index paints these paints are available now these in india is very competitive cost and of course there are several other material in like i belong to rajasthan i have seen the several people is still using the china mosaic tiles or the light color paint so the heat should not come inside the building these kind of things can reduce your heat island impact in that way other criteria is the light pollution reduction in sustainable site uh light pollution because we make our building very beautiful and we put a lot of lights outside that but what happened to the species around the building because if you put your light uh, from big halogen lights or something like that from the from the downstairs from the downside to the upside the lot of species around the building get disturbed and this is something the green building norm says we need to reduce that pollution reduction we don't need to put light from downside to the upside we always put our light to the facade not from the sky so this is something the light pollution reduction criteria told tell about it so this is uh, some of the some of the best practices in the sustainable site and planning the second which is a very very important because without this the life cannot imagine and which is jal and india uh, we are consuming water in any i think because we do not take care that there is because electricity is still have a 7 8 10 rupees cost but water doesn't have a cost the people think in that way but actually without water we cannot survive and this is something we need to understand i was attending a one conference where the people were showing me that of course when we say the and only the 3% is the potable water on the earth and out of 3% india is still have a very few very less so whatever or india of course we have seen in the past 3 4 years the chennai was ran out of water shimla was no water in that day and this this is a study saying by niti aayog that by 2025 there is a several cities in india which will not have the water and this is something we need to understand because building every person as per the national building code residential building person calculation when we say the 135 liter per li 135 per liter per capita per day and that is that is something we need to understand because we are making a several housing complexes where the 1000 or the 2000 people are living together and those 2000 people multiply by 135 you can imagine how much water is required in those buildings and there is a some basic things we can implement in our building design and can save lot of water actually we did some analysis with the lot of uh, projects uh, that where actually water goes in that whenever we want to save anything where we want to conserve anything there's a way 
called reduce reuse recycle the first concept is the reduction whatever we are using how can we reduce that so water use reduction is is possible because we use lot of water fixtures in our building water fixtures like wc water closet faucets showers uh, these are kitchen sinks these are the some of the fixtures we use in our building but we never care that actually how much water flow rate of those fixtures how much water goes in the per minute or per flush in that sometimes ago uh, the the wcs which is the water closets were coming around 10 to 12 liter per flush now these days because of the people are aware about these design parameters they talks about the green building and that is the reason wcs now these days you can get from the 2 liter to 4 liter kind of a dual flush system similarly the faucets were getting around 2 liter per th or 3 liter per minute water now the sensor based faucets are in the market and we can use and we can reduce a lot of water requirement this is the aerators like i like i you have seen in several air, several buildings like airports or the some five star hotels now they they have started to put aerators in the building aerators just increase the pressure because we as a human have tendency that water is not coming with the flow our hand will not wash but they did a technology that they increase the pressure the flow is in the they increase the pressure so the flow is coming directly on our hand so we feel with the less so that can that can save around 30 to 40% water require water requirement so now every because recently cpwd i have seen they notified that all the existing buildings from the government should opt this to put the aerators in the faucets area similarly sensor based like lot of faucets are coming sensor based urinals are coming sensor based which consumes very less water so these are the some technologies which we need to opt always in our building design don't go with that because the reason lot of people are because in the energy there is a star labeling the as a layman people understand i need to purchase a five star equipment because this consumes less, less electricity but water doesn't have any star labeling so you need to talk with the manufacturer you need to talk with your the the showroom guy that we need the flow rates of the fixtures if you have the flow rate you can understand which is consuming more which is consuming less and this is can save lot of water requirement similarly for the showers because the people will be really amazed to know the sometimes the shower consumes around 14 to 15 liters per minute and that is huge consumption when we do a shower the one person simply takes around 5 to 7, 7 minute shower and that is impacting to the more than 100 liter for the bath so we need to understand we need whenever you whenever you purchase we need to reduce that water reduction the second is the rain water harvesting which is the green building criteria talks about it lot of bylaws urban uh, when we talk about any development authority they have a mandatory norms with the some square um, if you have a some square yard minimum you need to put rain water harvesting or the rain water recharge system in the building and this is something we need to increase more and more because still in india only 8 to 10% entire rain water get collect collected or discharged is still huge requirement because rain water is the purest form of the water you don't do not need to treat anything and one side we are saying the cities are doesn't have a water and one side we are wasting the rain water so we need to increase our building design in that way that entire roof area or the non roof area entire water collection should happen on that either should be recharged in the ground or it should be we should make a rain water harvesting tank where we can collect the water and we can reuse that water for the gardening or the cleaning purposes but this is lot of buildings i have seen personally they designed properly but they don't operate properly they just make for the compliances purpose and they forget for that but this is something as a human because we will not able to save the water if we do not reuse the rain water so this is the calculation happen when we do the rain water harvesting design what kind of uh, tank size should happen what kind of the pit we need to design this is as per the meteorological department data on that specific city if you are in hyderabad you want to design that 
you have to take the rainfall of last one year how much rainfall has happened and accordingly we can calculate this design and green building has a mandatory criteria to do a rainwater uh, system designing in that way the third is the landscape design which is also the very major component we love landscaping we always we want to have a trees in our house but we need to understand the water requirement is also there on an average this is calculated as per the, the rule of thumb we say our an average 5 liter per meter square water is required for the landscaping 5 liter per meter square it depends upon the species to species but we do lot of landscaping in our building design we need to rethink like i am living in rajasthan rajasthan is the scarcity of the water how the landscape will get the water to grow in that and we need to understand when as a landscape designer we need to promote those plants in our building which are the native plants which are actually doesn't need lot of water because every state having a native plant rajasthan has some specific native plants andhra telangana has some native plants and in our building design we do not promote the more turf area or the grass area because it consumes lot of water and this design if we do with the proper plantation we can save lot of water requirement in that building and this uh, either any rating system you talk about they talks on that front that how can we reduce the landscaping water requirement fourth point the water efficiency the people uh, in the building the water metering because when you don't monitor you cannot save anything the monitoring is required for auditing and auditing is required for saving and this is something water metering the because i have seen several buildings they have energy meter but they don't have the water meter recently last to last week the government of india came up with the notification that every year the people have to do a water audit for their industry or the buildings because the the extraction from the ground water is not eligible now the, the people have to take permission otherwise they cannot get the ground water ground water directly from uh, from them and water metering is much more required because when you do the construction of any building you put up a lot of bore well you get the water you don't record that how much you have used in your, your building it is just a matter of 5000 or 10000 rupees for the water metering but if we monitor something we will get to know how much we are consuming in that building so water metering we can do now these days several green building or the hotel projects or hospital projects they are doing the sub metering as well they are putting the extra meter for for flushing extra meter for uh, 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 landscaping extra meter for other requirements but this is the water metering we should promote in our building design so we can get a lot of savings in that way and the final part is the water is the recycle and the reuse biggest change because in last 20 years i have seen i have uh, everyone is talking about the recycling why we say the 7 3% water in our entire world as a potable water we have 70% entire entire land area is a water when we talk about entire earth 70% why can't we recycle that why the lot of countries are doing that which doesn't have the water but similar way in the building also we need to think whatever the water we are using for the bathing purpose for the flushing purpose or the kitchen or some other areas because whatever the drinking we have done that water cannot recycle but other than the drinking water can't we recycle that we can easily or lot of buildings are already doing because this is now the part of environmental laws as per the if your building is 20000 square meter built up area you need to take the eia clearance which is the of course environmental impact assessment clearance and ec clearance they need that you should have a stp in your building which is called sewage treatment plant or the ept the effluent treatment plant and we can put these treatment plant in our building and can recycle entire water which is coming from our washrooms other than the black water we are using in wc but the entire gray water we are we can collect from the washroom area kitchen area and we can recycle that water and reuse in the landscaping also not only the landscaping now these days the 
as a plumbing designer the people are doing do a dual plumbing system in the building because the wc whatever the wc the black water is going why we are using the potable water in that area we should use the re re treated water in that build in that area and already the lot of hotels has started uh, i have i have done some building which is having a dual plumbing design and entire water is recycling in the uh, in the wc area landscaping area also the cooling tower requirement lot of building having a centralized air conditioning system and they have a cooling tower and the cooling tower also required water and that water we can reuse the stp water so these are the some parameters where we can save lot of water reduction this has been proved that if you design your building as per the green building design parameter there is a reduction of the 40 to 50% water consumption 40 to 50% is a huge number so this is i want to i explain the water side energy efficiency very very close to my heart because this is a something i do regularly in my building design energy as energy auditor as a ecbc and i want to focus here because energy prices are increasing we have seen the prices earlier it was of 3 to 4 rupee per unit now it is around 8 to 9 or 10 rupees or 14 some states having a 14 to 15 rupees unit of electricity as well and it will be increasing more and more and we need to conserve we need to understand that whenever because in the summer time whenever electricity bills goes higher in in our residential building we always worried about it how how air conditioning we are using how does it work so this is something we need to understand and as an as an architect i also uh, want to explain you because i i always feel the people says as an architect why the 20 years back we doesn't require air conditioning in our building but now these days we require air conditioning in our building we cannot we cannot uh, comfortably in sit in the building without air conditioning and this is some some people says this is because of climate change climate change is happening temperature is rising that is of course the one of the reason can be happen but the major thing we need to understand the design of our our building the design criteria earlier we were making a building with the climate responsive like if you visit sometimes the kerala having a different building karnataka having a different design rajasthan having a different design and different materials so this is something was happening 20 30 years back but now these days if you travel an entire country you will find the same kind of building why because everywhere either you go in the gurgaon mumbai every we have a five climatic zone in india when we talk about five climate zone in india warm and humid hot and dry cold moderate and of course so these are the kind the composite these five climate zone but why we are making the similar building everywhere and this is something the and as an architect you always learn the climate 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 responsive architecture and of course but why we don't follow in our design that why why we are just using if the some building is very beautiful in the western western countries but we are making the same building in india but we are not looking that how the western countries climate outside they are the very cold climate and we are in the very hot climate or sometimes the in the why we are making the same building here so energy efficiency as an architect in your hand always the i have done through the simulation approaches we have seen this research around 25 to 30% energy consumption of that building in the architect's hand if the architects design properly orientation proper building facade proper building envelope then the energy consumption can be reduced by 20 to 30% very easily and this is something we need to focus because the young architect the young of course they need to understand how we make a climate responsive building so this is several softwares available for doing the sun path analysis to doing the energy analysis to doing the simulation uh, uh, for the daylighting analysis there are the softwares available uh, i am not going to move much detail in that but you can see some of the pictures in the right side some of the softwares the output results in that but this criteria when we talk about energy efficiency the first requirement for the energy efficiency is a eco friendly refrigerant whatever the refrigerant we are using 
I am giving the background the reference because every air conditioning system having a some gas. That gas is a refrigerant. Earlier it was R12, R22. Now these days the R32 or 410. That is the major contributor in the global warming. And of course, air conditioning we use for our comfort, but we are we are damaging environment as well. So, but we can't. We we need to optimize that. Whatever the refrigerant we should use, we should use the some environmental friendly refrigerant which are available. We don't go with the direct any refrigerant like R12 or R22. Now these days, R22 will be also phase out very soon. But now these days, the government is also mandating that these refrigerant cannot be sell it out. So these kind of refrigerant we should use. Second is high efficiency HVAC equipment. HVAC is a heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. So there is a very good approach like Bureau of Energy Efficiency having a star labeling. We know the five star is the best and the one is one star is the worst. So we can always go with the five star, three star. But we need to understand as an engineer or as an architect also, if government is making the one star also five star, why government cannot ban all only the five star can sell it out? Because this is not possible. We need to understand the cycle of our system. Like if you are purchasing your split air conditioning system. and that is split ac only having running hours 2 hours per day you could doesn't run entire day why should you go for the five star because your split ac life cycle is around 8 to 10 years is your life cycle after 10 years you have to demolish that so your return of investment or the or the energy they will consume the when we talk about the embodied energy because when you talk about the embodied energy that will be the more higher than the Than the five star, so this is something. Uh, it depends upon the number of hours operation, that how much we are consuming. Then accordingly, we can we should purchase either it is a three star or the five star. We should, but minimum three star is a requirement as per the ECBC guideline, Energy Conservation Building Code. I'll I'll just focus on that also because this is something as an architect there is a very uh, <clears throat> very new field is coming up and lot of you might of my in your i think uh, i think some of you might have attended this programs also in your respective states but ecbc is a energy conservation building code developed in 2007 in india by ministry of power this is code says if the any commercial building having load more than 100 kilowatt then they need to comply with ecbc otherwise they will not get the permission to construct the building or the design the design permission on that so this code is going to mandate very soon in all over india already several state the 15 state has been notified and by next one or two years you will see the all the states in the country will follow this rule and this is everywhere in the world not in specific in india everywhere in the world you go in the united states every state california having title 24 no building can be constructed if they don't follow the ecbc thing and this is something as an architect should learn because architect make design the building and they have to understand how the ecbc they can uh, follow in their design or can comply with the government norms so very soon uh, you will see the there is a exam coming from bureau of energy efficiency which is called a ecbc ppa third party assessor which is a building energy auditor also right now we have a energy auditor for industries and all but there is a energy auditor building is specific in that architect can also write that exam if you clear that exam you can become a ecbc third party assessor and you can be responsible to assess those building in your states and this is something because most of you are from the colleges you are the faculties i would urge lot of opportunities are coming in this area because still in india i am one of the master trainer still in india only 122 people are the master trainers on ecbc only 122 in the population of 1.38 billion people you can imagine how much requirement is coming up so this is we uh, i would urge because this uh, entire ecbc every government is giving a two days or one day training program free of cost to the people to their colleges also sometimes so you can ask your respective states department to conduct these kind of training programs for the 
uh, for for uh, entire faculties or students. So ECBC talks about the equipment efficiency, lighting efficiency, V star appliances. So these all things will be covered under the ECBC criteria. There is an energy efficiency also one criteria called energy metering and management. Same thing as a water metering. We should meter, then we can audit that. And this is the required. Now these days the sum meter is required. And now we are at, we are in era of the artificial intelligence or the industry 4.0. Everything is on cloud. So you can gather entire energy consumption of your house automated on your app, and you can control from there. And this is the actually the world is going towards. All buildings will be automated, or the smart buildings we are talking about. So we need to we we already the building has been started, and we need to focus in that direction. There is another criteria called renewable energy. A lot of people having a myth about renewable energy that renewable energy is expensive or like that. But guys, I'll tell you, this is the future, not not the future. Only the next three, four, five years down the line, you will see the entire India, the like we have a DTS system like Tata Sky or something like. That. Every roof will have a renewable energy production unit, either is a solar or the wind or the hybrid system, and it is very uh, clean energy we are going to generate because we are not burning the fossil fuel and. Word is going towards the net zero energy building or net positive energy building. Already in India, some of the university has taken the initiative to make their entire campus to net zero. What is the net zero building? Net zero building is those building which cons which which generate their own electricity. Whatever they are consuming in entire year, they are generating their own through the renewable, through the wind or hybrid. They, that is called a net zero building. If you, whenever you go to tra to travel to Delhi, there is an Indra Paryavaran Bhavan building, which is the Ministry of Renewable Energy head office. Uh, that building is entirely net zero building. Nalanda University is coming up with a net zero concept in the campus. In the entire campus, they are going to make in the net zero. So this is something because uh, you are you need, because now these days the every state having the open access policy. open access policy they can they can uh, wield their power whatever they generate from the renewable like if you have a university and you have a solar power plant on that but university doesn't have any consumption on saturday and sunday because it is off but your power plant renewable energy plant will generate electricity so what will you do you will back to the utility company and entire after a month you can reduce that from your energy bills whatever you generate so entirely when you calculate you your energy consumption is actually in zeros or in the negative side and these this is actually concept now the designers are moving towards the net zero but to make the net zero building energy efficient building is required without energy efficiency you cannot make the net zero directly so this is uh, in the energy efficiency side similarly for the building materials and resources very much required what kind of materials are coming up lot of architects of course using the same material since long 10 years 15 years but the technology is changing they need to understand we have seen the era the lighting from incandescent bulb to leds now the earlier it was coming 100 watt to now there is a 5 watt led the same lux level similarly on the building material side whatever the materials we are using on the facade either it is a fly ash brick or the brick or the ac block what what kind of insulations are coming so the heat coming inside the building can reduce when we talk about the building envelope the major heat coming from the roof wall or the windows and what kind of these materials we should use in our building design i have seen the most of the architects whenever they select a glass because the glass is required for lighting purpose in our building when when we select a glass a lot of people see the aesthetic view or the color of the glass but very few people ask the energy parameters of that glass which is the energy parameter is solar heat gain coefficient ssgc value or the visible light transmittance how much light it can be pass from outside to the inside and these are the some technical parameters every architect should ask to their vendor because select your glass accordingly it depends your energy because there is a several heat lot of heat comes from the glazing and that is the reason we have seen the lot of glass building when we make 
uh, entire hundred percent glazing building, the energy consumption is goes very very high because we cannot compare the six mm or the twelve mm glass layer with the hundred mm or one hundred ten ten mm brick because the heat coming from outside. We are fortunate that we have a sun. Sun gives a light, but the heat is also the par parameter. In the north part of India, where the Delhi or the Rajasthan, too much temperature goes very very high, and we need to put a lot of air conditioning to reduce that comfort level. So we need to understand those materials properly in detail. Similarly, for the local materials, always try to promote the local materials. The intent behind it, because when you purchase any imported material, like the people say, I have used Italian marble, but Italian marble when comes from the Italy. It it emit a lot of carbon emissions in the vehicle transmission. Always try to promote the local material, and that is the intent. The green building norm says that if we utilize the materials which are within the range of the 500 kilometer, we will get some point. Like in Rajasthan, I have seen several building made up from the stone from Dhalpur, from uh, from some specific stones which developed or which only. the ore is in rajasthan and people were making those days but now these days the architects are using entirely imported materials to make a building there and this is something we are impacting the environment the certified green building materials for i think for the layman the uh, these authority these green building authorities are coming up with the certification program also i have seen the cii having the green pro certification which is the green product certification griha also having some kind of they are testing in the laboratory and giving the rating on that so as a layman the people should get aware what kind of materials are the green another point of the building waste management building waste management uh, because whatever the waste we use in our building how can we recycle that during the construction and during the operation also very very much important lot of construction demolished happen during the demolition the waste demolition happen and that waste goes directly to the landfill and i have seen like if you have visited in, in delhi the waste landfills are going the more than height than the qutub minar and there are the some of the landfills like that we are wasting our entire land in that the waste landfills we need to reduce that waste so wastage can be reduction if we segregate the, the things if we segregate during the construction as a paper glass plastic we can we can sell out to the recycler so this is something in the building design we should focus similarly for the organic waste management for existing building or existing like university i because a lot of you belong to that every student or every faculty when we consume food there is a food wastage also happen what happened to that food waste either if it if i talk about the 10000 student university every on an average there is a green building on says on an average person waste is around 100 gram kg 100 gram per day it have if i multiply 10000 people into 100 gram it is cover coming around 1000 kg wastage per day what happened to that waste so how can we convert that waste into the organic through the organic waste converter we can convert into the manure we can use that manure in the in our landscaping to growth of the plants or either like i have seen the several universities now coming up with the biogas plant they are converting entire waste and making the gas for their kitchen area in the in the mass area to cook the food and this is you are recycling you are generating the free energy with the waste and actually waste is a wealth a lot of people say the waste lot of new startups coming in the waste they are making several new things with the waste management so this is come uh, something in the building material waste now the indoor environmental quality which is called vayu very much important uh, area after the covid because covid the one small virus when we say the can can do the damage for entire world for the 7 8 months down the line a lot of people has lost their lives during this covid situation and we need to understand and uh, this is not us only the covid as a human please understand we we take 3 4 or 5 liter water per day and when we take a water we always see the quality of the water how it is how the tds level is there how it is so we put a ro system in our building so we put a ro to treat that water but what you have done for air on an average there was a study saying the people 
consumes around 21 kg of air every day in their body and you cannot see that air what kind of particulates in that how that air is impacting on your lungs so this is something we need to understand that how air quality is more important there are several studies saying if your air quality is better your productivity get increase your absenteeism get reduced and there's a case studies happens on the green building that green building is not only saving the energy or water green building is increasing the productivity of the people green building is in is increasing the productive like there was a study from one hospital if you put your patient in any normal building if you put your patient in the green building where the natural daylight is coming or the proper pressure is coming your patient recovery will be more faster than the normal building so it it is because try to understand 97% of our expenses in any building goes on the human goes on the people because they the salaries the perks what the companies provide the 90 5 to 97% goes on that other than is the only energy or water consumption is there so if the human is good then everything is good or the employees are happy everyone think is can happy so that is the reason lot of it companies are focusing to make their building more wellness productive or more indoor environmental productive in that way so we need to understand uh, because i am talking only right now the indoor environmental and this is the study we need to rethink in our daily life everyone is talking about outdoor ki that outdoor air is bad outdoor quality is going very bad pm 2.5 but how many of you are thinking that 90% of the time you spend your time in indoors either right now you everyone is sitting in the either is office or either at home or either in car 90% of your daily life you spend your indoors and indoor is the more more can damageable than the outdoor to your body because these days when we talk about indoor like you are sitting in a air conditioning room right now your split ac is running you have closed all the doors and windows right now please tell me how because you are emitting a carbon dioxide right now where the oxygen is coming in the room because you have closed entirely all the roof or all the windows and the doors and the split ac is running in that because split ac only recirculating your return air whatever the air is growing that is only coming with the filtration through the filtration media there is no oxygen or no fresh air is coming inside the split ac and that is the reason we need to understand when we do the building design as a mep consultant as an architect please always give the fresh air provision in your building when when the building is air conditioned because air conditioned building in the centralized air conditioning system there is a provision for treated fresh air unit or the fresh air unit but the split ac there is no provision there is no technology intervention right now but you can put some openable area to put up that air in that so this is this this is the green building says the ashray 62.1 which is the which is the code for ventilation and which we have to follow that code while designing any building similarly for the next second is the thermal comfort they talk about because air conditioning required for comfort and comfort having a different definition like i am a i am i have some different criteria for comfort i am very comfortable at 25 degree centigrade but someone is very more young they are not comfortable at 22 degree centigrade either i have seen several buildings they put up a 16 degree 18 degree centigrade thermostat at your air conditioning system please try to understand point 1 degree centigrade if you reduce that impacts the 6% of energy consumption of your air conditioning system and the the power because whatever the outside air to the inside air the lot of energy required in that and that energy will be more if the difference will be more so comfort definition is very very much required lot of people are doing phd on this subject as an in india we should focus on the adaptive thermal comfort strategy and i was really wondering sometimes ago that <clears throat> people in india always feel the com the air conditioning is make a cool inside the building because in in trains in railway railways i have seen the air conditioning coaches people put in the summer season entire air conditioning and giving a 
giving a blanket in the in 25 rupees in the blanket the people are using that so air conditioning doesn't mean to use the blanket air conditioning is just for comfort not making a switzerland in india so this is the comfort definition now th- recently i think in the start of the 2020 only the government came up with the notification that most of the government building they have to follow the 24 degree centigrade as a thermostat they cannot go beyond the thermo- 24 degree centigrade so this is something uh, you guys have to understand when you do the building design similarly smoking prohibition uh, the smoking that when you design a building try to uh, prohibit it in the building or you can keep the outside area for the smoking so it can uh, it cannot recirculate the same air to the non smoking people as well green building talks about the low voc paint which is the volatile organic compound paint very much required because lot of architects whenever they purchase paints they always look at the color but there is no extra cost you need to pay for the low voc please ask for any vendor please give me the voc paints uh, which having a low voc limit for either the paint adhesive sealants because you have seen you have realized when you go in the newly constructed room area where the newly paint is happening you get some smell which directly hit on my mind and that is smell is actually because of the voc and the lead content now these there is the lead free is coming up but now several companies are also coming up with the low voc paint limit similarly for the co2 level monitoring uh, in, in in the in the conference room areas or the where the more occupancy sits together please always put a co2 level monitor in that room it is not much expensive uh, uh, meter but it, it can monitor the co2 level of that room like if the 1000 ppm level goes high your co2 level uh, so that fresh air can can come inside by using the tfa and all these method so this is also can happen co2 level monitoring interior lighting and day light very much required i would say the very much lighting because these are the some small these are the some necessary requirement light because whenever you purchase any house you never purchase those house where the natural light is not coming always people wants the proper natural light should come because actually natural lights give you the increase in your productivity and this is something the green building also talks about it that we need to provide the natural light but not the glare lot of people put a glass and then put a blinds in that and they don't use the natural light so but don't do that why make a selection of your glass that glare should not be in that way so you should put on the blinds as well there and the acoustic performance uh, green building talks about the noise level criteria as per the national building code we need to follow that so when a lot of people talks why what are the benefits the sustainability are the three pillars of sustainability social economic and environmental these are the three pillars of any sustainability and green buildings impacts on all these parameters of course improve air and water quality conserve natural resources economically or your operation cost can be reduced and the social benefits you are improving the comfort and the health well being of your employees or or your team members in that building <clears throat> so what are the impact of the green building 35% reduction in the carbon emission as a conventional building 40% less water used than the conventional building 50% energy consumption can be reduced in the green building when you focus on that and of course the solid waste whatever we are generating that can be reduced by 70% in that way this is the impact on the green building normally now a lot of people ask that what are the green build, green building ratings in india where we can get the which program we should do that so there are several rating programs in india because it's still after these so many programs in india india having a less than 5% construction is going green is still 5% because the people awareness the architectural awareness is should be more and more every day so these are the some rating system usgpc which is the lead rating system in the world wide all the entire entire world more than 195 countries are following this program igbc by cii the indian green building council greha the green rating integrated habitat assessment socm jam the green environmentally friendly movement and ag certification by ifc world bank this is also the one one of the rating system well rating which is for the human well being rating system and recently the cpwd also started their ghar rating which is the green habitat accomplished rating all the cpwd building should follow this ghar rating in that so these are the green rating system in india in more detail of course the lead is very 
old program in the world 1993 it was started in from the us and following in existing building category core and shell new construction school so there were multiple rating system and you can see more detail at the usgbc website either you go to the us or saudi arabia or uk bangladesh lead is the well recognized and they have a credential program also you can become a lead ap or the lead ga with lead ga to write uh, this exam and it will definitely add up in your cv as well igbc is very popular in india uh, they have uh, they have uh, of course head offices in hyderabad only and in hyderabad they that building is the towards the net zero building they are making igbc having more than 5900 projects in india and 7 billion square feet construction they gives the gold platinum silver rating they have also multiple rating system this is the headquarter of cii in hyderabad which is the uh, first of course this was the first green building rating in 2001 in india and now they have they are trying to convert into the net zero building uh, uh, rating for that griha is very popular in the government side a lot of government projects goes in the green griha rating system and uh, they also griha was firstly adopted by the ministry of environment for as long back and it is uh, it is also they have a multiple rating system uh, swa griha griha for affordable housing and you can get more detail on the griha website Uh, this is the uh, i think timeline for the griha rating there is a gem sustainability certification program uh, which is as by asochem asochem is same uh, industrial body like cii and they started the gem certification to one gem to five gem and uh, there is they also have a gem cp program which they conduct every month the training program in that way edge is edge is very popular in the developing countries like in africa in uh, in southeast countries also because it is funded by the world bank and ifc the ifc is the one of the branch of the world bank and a uh, lot of people this is a tool a uh, lot of people are going towards in this direction also in india also some of the projects are going for the as certification so <clears throat> well rating system well is for the well building cert for human health and wellness it is actually not a green i would say it is a wellness rating how your building the people residing in that building are well being so this is talks about nourishment fitness comfort mind everything this is something not only green they talk about the wellness after covid of course in india this rating is also getting very popular in the commercial areas but in the us they have many uh, certified projects uh, in all in the us uh, right now because i told you there is a productivity and the salary is benefited 86.3 only energy is 0.8% 8% is the rental of the building so we need to focus on the bigger area picture if you do something in this you can save your building more productive and this is something the well is focusing and this is the ghar rating the the cpwd they have a green green plus and super green you can get more detail there very simple but they want that every government building the but done by the cpwd should follow this ghar manual in that way incentives why we should go for the green building lot of incentives the government has already been started to giving uh, these are the links my presentation will be i will be giving to hema also so you will click on this and you get all the incentive details there uh, so like i'll give an example there's a 10% extra fir in the west bengal government is giving if you make any green building certified from igbc greha or the lead certification you will get 10% extra fir the developer will get similarly recently rajasthan will came up with the 15 per 10% extra fir only so they are also giving the extra fir some of the uh, like pimpri chinchwad pune is giving the tax rebate on uh, on property tax if you are making if your building is green you will get some property tax rebate in that criteria so incentives are there uh, or government is promoting more way uh, so this was the i think quote by the bill gates because the climate change uh, will be as deadly as corona virus by 2060 uh, if you guys are following the presidential debate in us right now the both of the presidential candidate are talking on climate change because of course the trump was not in the pro for the climate change but now every citizen want their the countries should focus on the climate change area so this is something is very alarming and we all need to focus and as a human being as an architect and of course as a technocrat we can in, we can contribute a lot for the building design and if we if we thought about it that we should make our building design or we teach people we teach our young engineers or young architects in this direction 
whenever the architects will go definitely they will try to make a green building it will it, it will impact a lot i am sure right now people are very less who are focusing but once we have a lot of people in this direction it can impact a lot to the nation or the world so we have to change the way what we are working we need to focus and overcome the climate change otherwise our future generation will be on the dark because after 50 60 years our next generation to next generation will have lot of lot of problems in the energy side or the water side or the air quality side because air quality we were not talking 10 years back in delhi anywhere but now these days every year we are focusing the government is trying to reduce that so we need to we need to act now so thank you so much uh, uh, you guys can connect me on the linkedin uh, i am very active on the social media on linkedin and twitter uh, these areas and whenever you need any queries any question you can feel free to write me at entire focus and please contribute to make the nation green in that way thank you so much i'll be more happy to take some questions now <coughs> yeah same sir sir uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box uh, so uh, miss uh, architect priya pradeep is asking uh, can you name a few green refrigerants that are available in indian market right so green refrigerants basically which having the less odp ozone depletion potential so right now the r32 r410 r407 these are the refrigerant which having a less gwp global warming potential so these are the some refrigerant you can see you can talk with any air conditioning manufacturer that we need eco friendly refrigerant still these refrigerant are not actual green but it will impact but that but definitely as compared to the r12 or r22 these will less global warming potential in the environment so you can talk for the split ac r32 is very popular r410 is in several companies are coming up so we need to go with that refrigerant in our design there's another question uh, what happens to carbon footprint if ers energy regulation scheme arises in future like brs and lrs okay so i'm not sure what is the brs and lrs but the carbon footprint i had given you the direct relation that 1 kwh of energy is equivalent to 800 to 900 gram of carbon emission if these schemes like ecbc mandate if happen any building if they follow the ecbc that means that building is consuming less 30% or 40% energy as compared to the conventional building and you can imagine that how will it much contribute to the carbon emission there are several power plants we need to shut off actually this was a study was happened that if we actually implement ecpc there is a lot of fossil fuel dependency can reduce uh, just doing the implementation of that so it will impact yeah actually i will add here to sai kumar's question <coughs> so the concept uh, of brs and lrs that is building regularization and land regularization will not hold good for ecbc because ecbc certification is given to buildings which are uh, having prior permissions from the local municipal authorities if you don't have uh, a local municipal authority permission you you are not uh, eligible to uh, go for the mandate of ecbc or green buildings any any of these uh, so brs and lrs uh, uh, they are out of scope for any energy conserved buildings okay so lrs and vrs doesn't have any role here yes, thank you yeah. thank you sir for explaining this yeah And I think so there's another question, sir. Right, from Asta. Yeah, yeah from Asta Kalia. All right. So very good question, Asta. You have asked that which, as a green building practitioner, so it is very difficult question for me also because uh, there is always the four five rating system in India, and which one we have to opt it. It actually depends on the type of building. I because in during the presentation I explained the lead is very popular in worldwide. so when we talk about in india if you are going with any it company or any manufacturing unit which having a export then definitely the lead is more viable for them because for that they will get the good of, uh, uh, because entire world now knows about the lead certification 
but for the griha is very very much popular in the government in india if you are making any building which is government building and they want to opt for the griha rating for that because in indian climatology some parameters are linked with the in, in the griha system so uh, it depends upon the type of projects i give you an example like it companies like infosys they are adopting a griha and lead both they are going in the both rating system so it depends project to project if the client having a some budget constraint and they want to something uh, like the more, more more modernized or in that way they want to explore more in the export opportunities so definitely go with the lead but in india the griha is also the very vast and good rating system okay thank you sir Yeah, it's, it's something like this. Like, what is that you are actually planning the building for? That becomes very, very important. So, right. lead is like if you are expecting some multinational company to come and take lease in your building, then lead is one uh, uh, rating system that you should go for. Because all the European and American uh, multinational companies, uh, they they. It recognizes lead as a certification, like a, whether it is with respect to to the indoor air quality in that building or energy efficiency of that building. So, if you are looking for uh, uh, someone to occupy that building, a multinational company, then it is a lead. And your building, if uh, you, if you think that uh, there is nothing uh, related to multinationals, it is only within India and all that, then Griha is uh, good enough. And maybe as <coughs> Uh, sir was telling or shri gupta sir was telling that infosys goes for both uh, griha and lead because they are very responsible companies for india and they are doing business with multinational companies so they definitely would like to uh, go for both the systems and uh, definitely there is some capital cost that goes into any of these uh, rating systems and there are uh, the rate of return is also very good okay the rate of return is very good so it depends upon the company's capital investment capacity so infosys will definitely go for both because they have deep pockets and they can wait for the internal rate of return so they definitely will go for both of it so it depends upon finally what the billing is for absolutely sir i think you are totally uh, right in that way uh, and uh, so this is the the most of the companies are focusing uh, in the direction only if they want to make something uh, because griha also having a limitation with the number of rating if you want to make something data center griha doesn't have a dedicated rating for data center yes. so you have to either opt for the igbc or the lead rating in that way so yes. this is something uh, is uh, Great. So I think the Ahmed is also the same question. So Ahmed, I think your question has been covered. The Shinana is asking, what is the most effective way to enhance people awareness toward energy consumption in their building? So very nice question. I think I am uh, working with Bureau of Energy Efficiency in, in this area also. That school is the right way. The kids, when we talk about the K to 12 and the young architects or engineers in your colleges, because the most effective way. the people awareness if we actually train in the school level lot of uh, now the bureau of energy efficiency is coming up with lot of school programs they are training at the school level debate competition they are going to have and the people should get aware what energy consumption we are doing and they are doing a competition between the students if they come up with the every month their energy bill should be less so people should get value in that way so this is the people are focusing in the second way awareness is training training and training this fdp program will helps a lot i think this is a great initiative by aict so the people should get aware of the new technologies and what's happening actually because always there is a gap between academia and industry because when i graduated there is always gap when i was working in the professional way and this gap can be reduced by you doing these kind of fdp programs and awareness should happen so i'm sure because i can see the 60 people more than 60 people here and lot of people on the youtube should be watching out those people if five people also do something that the awareness will be transmit transfer to other people also so okay. this is the best way for listen thank you another question from shobha the gray and the black water treatment should be given to every neighborhood is it not helpful Uh, so gray and black water treatment is happening already already it is a part of the environmental laws now uh, people has to follow otherwise they get not the permission and every residential Very society right. so every residential society every factory industry they are working working in this direction 
and of course we need to reuse that water for the grey water black water but still people in india having a tendency it is a treated water how can we reuse that how can we touch that water but the uh, the treatment is increasing in that technology is going in a good way the earlier we were people were using the primary or secondary treatment now the tertiary treatment they are using the bod level which is the basis the the, the bod or the cod level is in that range the people can drink also that water is happening in the world but if still we are not talking about the drinking at this moment we are talking to reuse in our building design and it is going to mandate very soon everywhere so you will you will see now the now the lot of companies are working on the portable stp like for your house you have a six people living in your house how can you treat that portable water entire recycled water for your house so this is also the people are talking about like ro when you using the ro system you are you are wasting 3 liter water for making a 1 liter a pure ro water but those ro water you are wasting in the kitchen sink how can we reuse that water in our buildings <clears throat> so things are happening i am sure you will see uh, this development in the actual design in the buildings and i am all i am very hopeful in that way so yeah even in telangana the government local municipality has mandated stp plans uh, for uh, group housing projects so any apartment having uh, so many number of units should have a stp plant and the treated water should be used for landscaping and uh, for flush water so now uh, it is becoming little more uh, uh, mandate uh, that uh, we recycle the water that is happening and absolutely and awareness is like uh, as uh, ashu gupta sir was telling you awareness is very very important i i can just give you a small example of uh, a renewable power plant a power project taken up by a gated community in hyderabad uh, we have a gated community in hyderabad malaysian township so they have a lot of corpus fund uh, because it is a very huge uh, gated community so they have a huge corpus fund so what they did is like uh, they took loan uh, based on that corpus fund it is a fixed deposit so the bank gave them loan and they have put up a huge solar power plant in the gated community so now uh, <clears throat> after uh, uh, one year they uh, they, are, they are surprised that uh, more than they are saving more than 15 lakhs of rupees on their common electric uh, utility charges and they are actually saving lot of money so so this kind of awareness this kind of awareness can uh, actually uh, make everyone look towards uh, uh, renewable energy sources right because uh, there is long way to go uh, uh, the solar energy getting on to our rooftops but definitely gated communities where there are groups of houses right they have where they have uh, uh, corpus funds uh, which are parked in the bank so they can get loans and they can install a good uh, amount of solar power uh, plants and that can give back lot of uh, energy to the society and so this awareness is definitely catching up and uh, as uh, professionals and uh, i'm very happy that uh, because there was an architect uh, in that uh, what is a society office Uh, they could do this so basically as an architect if you find the scope to create awareness about uh, all this you should be doing that that way we will be making india more greener more faster uh, than what we are planning that's all yeah thank you uh, ashu gupta for such a wonderful presentation and i think everyone has learned something uh, very valuable and important Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, same. Uh, I think there is one more question. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, Ahmed is asking if you can tell about EPI. Okay. All right. So EPI is an energy performance index. So whenever you make a, whenever it is a, there is an existing building and you want to understand that building is consuming more energy or the less energy, you can calculate the EPI very easily. the epi formula is the total energy consumption in all the 12 years divided by build up area so if your epi is so your your 12 month energy consumption i am assuming is 1 lakh kwh so 1 lakh kwh divided by total built up area which is a 10000 square feet i would say or 10000 square meter so that is the number is epi 
and this epi you can compare with the bureau of energy efficiency standard there is on the bureau of energy efficiency website you can download the epi range for the different climate zone like if your building is in composite climate the epi will be different your is in warm and humid that epi will be different so epi is the energy performance index total energy consumption divided by built up area so that number you can calculate I think that, that answers the question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hema, Hema. Yeah, there is one one question. I think, Doctor Navin. Yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. Rashu, sir, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Sure. I, actually, I was uh, just uh, wondering that EPI. Uh, what you explained now, it uh, it uh, is uh, having uh, certain. Uh, you know, it is only limited to HVAC and the internal lighting loads, right? or is it does it include other things also no sir so basically sir as the epi when we calculate uh, it depends upon that which what kind of certification you are doing for the bureau of energy efficiency purpose they only exclude the business equipment so when you calculate the epi your basement parking area should be excluded oh. or also your miscellaneous equipment should be excluded so miscellaneous equipment like electrical equipments if you have a uh, printer or your uh, or the laptop consumption or the computer consumption that should be excluded only the hvac lighting or pumping yeah. or whatever it's spending yeah. that that consumption should be calculated yeah that's what i just wanted to clarify that <laughs> yeah so, all the fixed uh, fixed assets yeah. which are yeah. consuming the energy <laughs> not the uh, other but this is this is something sir i am talking about only the bureau of energy per efficiency purpose yeah. but when you actually calculate uh, for the uh, for the other countries also they cuz they take care all the energy parameters in that so it depends upon the country to country what epi or eui like in us they say the energy utilization index so eui eui is there per per feet square and in india it is a meter square so whenever you area is calculating it should be converted into the meter square in an epi comparison okay thank you great thank you so thank you doctor All right, uh, sir. Uh, can we have a group photo? Uh, all the participants, please turn on your uh, videos. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hema. Alright. <clears throat> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we will all uh, meet I back at two o'clock. Yeah. Yes. I request all the participants to please fill in the attendance before leaving. Uh, you can stay on or leave the session uh, but please be back before 2 o'clock for the next next session on uh, uhi uh, yeah, that is a very interesting uh, presentation by architect uh, p uh, bhimesh uh, very interesting uh, work that he has done in visakhapatnam uh, rotary mode separator so i would like everyone to join uh, in time so that we can start off and i i think there will be many questions in on that presentation it's a very typical 
uh, presentation about an architect's intervention in uh, transportation engineering. Okay. All right. So we'll meet uh, back uh, by two o'clock. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.